Hey there, Jimmy. Yes, you. Don't be shy. Do you ever think your parents just don't get you? Not just because they're adults, but every ideal they hold dear just doesn't match what you think. And Jimmy's parents. Do you ever think that Jimmy and all his friends are a bunch of weirdos and this world is going to crash and burn? Well, what you're experiencing is a generational gap. And while this seems apparent to many, have you ever wondered just what are the specific differences between your generation and somebody else's? What causes the changes that are so easily observable on a mass scale? That's what I plan on answering today. While I intend on covering all the specific generations here soon, let's first take a look at some pioneers in the world of generations. Strauss and Howe, who revolutionized the view of this concept in the early 90s with the book Generations. Not universally accepted as fact, but at the same time easily the best theory out there on the subject, the Strauss-Howe generational theory gives pattern to this perceived randomness. The result is a map of sorts, with cyclical changes in generations. These can be identified as turnings, which are identified as events within that generation. These are labeled as high, awakening, unraveling, and crisis. High turning is a time that is generally pleased with where society is and where it seems to be going, without a desire for mass change to the system. Within these generations, the idea of being individualistic is more frowned upon and generally less commonplace than other generations. This is because it is seen as better for society as a whole to work as one and to achieve this conformism. Awakening describes when the standard conformism of society becomes an issue for many and the result is dissatisfaction to the systems held in place over a long period of time. This is often seen as kicking off society's desire for culture, usually drastically differing from recent arts. This is because during the awakening, many deem the time following high turning to be quite negative and a dark time for art due to the standards set in place. Religion is based on a more personal level, with the large-scale churches being seen as another member of the system. After this follows unraveling, in which the ideals of being an individual are valued the greatest. It follows many standards of the awakening, but to greater effect, as more grow tired of the standards set by past generations and society in general. Finally, is crisis, in which society begins to fear everything is falling apart. Individualism becomes second place to society coming together for a cause, and people desire to identify within a group of others. A mindset of confidence is commonplace, that what is being done is right. So that's the turnings. Now we'll take a look at the different moments in the most recent century that these actually occurred. Starting off is Crisis, which can be identified as the Wall Street Crash of 1929 leading to the Great Depression and leading into World War II. The merits of joining together as a group are pretty obvious here. Worldwide poverty, followed by the largest war ever seen, led to a mindset of joining together for the greater good. Next up is the high turning which differs based on the country you're in, but I'll cover America, because I said so. As World War II came to a close, American pride and strength was at its peak. As soldiers returned home, life seemed to return back to normal. After the turmoil of war, it was seen as better to just conform with society and no artistic outreach seemed needed. Following this is Awakening, which is very apparent with the counterculture movement in the 1960s. This led to hippies, individualism, and drug abuse. The resulting clash with big business, government, and religion, all of which were labeled quite commonly as the man, reinforced the awakening turning. Next is unraveling, which results in the culture war of the 90s, and still lasts to this day. Many issues suddenly arise and become larger discussions than years past. This is sometimes generalized as liberals versus conservatives, but on a much more deeper level involves the issues of gun rights, global warming, abortion, immigration, and many, many more movements that you all see every day. Some attribute the difference between seculars and religion, but personally I don't think this works in all cases, with many overlap on the issues. And again, we return to crisis. In this time frame, 9-11 begins a shift of sorts, with society seeing a need to come together. However, the overlap of this unraveling seems to change the general cycle. The culture war and crisis combine, with many coming together on issues into groups and fighting for the greater good. I'm sure you have an opinion on which is the correct side, but I'm not looking into delving into this political mess. Now that we made it through that, let's take a look at what each generation is actually known for. First, let's start off with the Lost Generation, born 1883 to 1900. 
This generation reached adulthood, or teenager years, around World War I, and this along with the Roaring Twenties led to the namesake, meaning lost, as in without direction. The perception is that after the war, this generation is without direction in a post-war world. This would lead to the Roaring Twenties, a time of great change, culminating in the Great Depression, meaning this generation would be well within adulthood during the economic turmoil. Individualism and breaking the norms would be commonplace during these years. Next is the GI generation, or the greatest generation. Born from 1901 to 1924, this generation's childhood lasted during the Great Depression and would go on to fight in World War II. The name comes from the Second World War affecting the entire generation and the selfless nature of the troops in war. Society came together for the greater good. Following the generation serving in the war was the Silent Generation, which would have been born in the late 1920s to the early 1940s. This generation would be the one to fight in the Korean War, civil rights movements, and the creation of modern rock and roll. The name comes from the fact that this generation would have been born during the Depression, a time in which the parents were far less likely to have kids due to the cost of raising a child, so it doesn't have as large of a population as other generations. Next is the generation very commonly referred to as baby boomers. Born after World War II until 1964, the first wave of baby boomers were born after soldiers returned from war and grew up during the new wave of consumerism and American pride after the war. Early members of this generation would fight in Vietnam, but this would be partly the reason the baby boomer categorization is a bit too vague as somebody born in 1964 would have little to no similarity to someone born after World War II in terms of social climate. The baby boomers were the first to grow up with television as the norm and rock music on the radio. The Red Scare occurring during the childhood of early baby boomers would lead to a massive fear of communism across the general public. This generation would also be those to form the hippie image, Woodstock, protests, and whatnot, which would divide a generation between left-leaning social reformers and conservatives growing up on the American pride life. Later baby boomers are often distinguished as a generation of their own, named sometimes Generation Jones, who would grow up during the economic downturn of the 1970s. Named after the slang term, keeping up with the Jones, as to referring to consumers purchasing as almost a competition of sorts. Often those born in the mid-1950s to 60s are considered a part of this generation. Next up is Generation X, with those born around 1965 to sometime in the early 1980s. Within this generation, society becomes much closer to modern day. Divorce rates soared, and some argue a mindset of individualism rose from this. This generation is also considered to be one where children had far more freedom from parental supervision than previous generations, also contributing to this individualistic lifestyle. This generation would enter school post-integration, which would make the generation as a whole less racist than previous generations. Of course, this is generalizing. MTV became mainstream for this generation, leading to a diversion from core music genres. Often this generation has been represented in pop culture and thought of slackers. But this seems to be nothing more than a hyperbole and the commonplace resentment older generations have for upcoming generations. This generation is often attributed as prone to starting new businesses, which has definitely negated the stereotype. And now, onto millennials. Born in the late 1970s to early 2000s, this generation is one in which the name of the generation is often cited due to a seismic shift in the culture between it and its predecessors. At this point, the traits are again divided like they were in the baby boomer days. While some adapt a mindset of social change, identify as a group, and acting towards the greater good, this is far more a generalization of a subgroup rather than the generation as a whole. As studies show, this mindset primarily is commonplace in middle class white households. And outside of that demographic, that ideology is far less commonplace than often claimed. Often it's suggested that the generation leans more liberally than its predecessors, and this appears certainly true, with presidential candidate Bernie Sanders earning more support than both of the presidential candidates combined. The generation is cited as the primary force between a culture of political correctness, with a study showing up to 40% of members of the generation supporting government censorship of speech offensive to minority groups in the USA. Often traits include millennials being far less likely to move out of parents' house earlier after high school, in which the Great Recession and unemployment rates are often cited. 
Religion is far less prominent in millennial culture than previous generations, with similar ideas towards it as previous awakening and unraveling generations, rather than other crisis generations. Finally is Generation Z, which is often identified as the generation growing up after the Great Recession, and the first generation in which full access to technology is commonplace from childhood to adulthood. Since this generation is still growing up, it's nearly impossible to accurately describe too many attributes associated with it, but it appears that technology is defining to everything from business to education within this generation. And as expected, they will be the first to take full advantage of its benefits. Years of this generation's birth aren't entirely decided, and likely won't be for another decade or so, but many believe it'll describe the mid-1990s to 2020 or so. So that's a history of this past century of generations. Which do you identify with? Do you think these generations are a fair assessment of people born in these years? Leave your comments below. This is Cody of Knowledge Hub.